Well, everyone, hello. Um, I've been actually trying to avoid doing this for a while, but finally someone came into my office one day and said, you ought to give a TED Talk. And I said, ah, people have been asking me that for years. I'm not going to do it. But she was very persuasive, so here I am today. <laughs> so the title of my talk, so I'm, you know, maybe some of you are fans of a television show called The Big Bang Theory. Well, I'm actually one of the people who does that stuff, but I'm not one of those characters, clearly. And so it turns out that real folks do that stuff, not the caricature that you see on Hollywood. And I am not here to give you a physics class this morning. Instead, what we're going to talk about is something that, well, something I think that's more important. You know, we live in a society where if you listen to lots of discussion in the media, it looks like faith on the one hand and science on the other are having a war. And I say, you know, that's kind of ridiculous because in the way that the human experience is so complicated, we really need to have sort of both. And in particular, I often get asked this question about, well, gee, do you believe in the Big Bang? Do you believe? And that's the wrong question for science. So what we're going to try to do today is to delineate how science as a system of knowing is different from other human systems of knowing. And so we are going to hang this on the discussion of the difference between truth on the one hand and accuracy on the other. So, you know, for thousands of years, philosophers have been trying to define truth. So it's clear that within 15 minutes, I'm not going to succeed. So I'm not going there. What we physicists do often, instead of trying to answer the what is question, we try to understand the properties of things. So let me lay out for, for you some of the things I think might be properties of this thing we call the truth. And for me, the truth is spelled with all capital letters, right? So the truth, I suspect, should be something that doesn't change, right? It should be, it should be ironclad. It should be adamantine. It should be hard. It should be fixed, not subject to some whim. I think those are all properties that most people would accept as part of something being the truth. On the other hand, if you ask me about accuracy, it turns out that mm, that's more like who I am as a person. Let's see, let's go through a little story about how I can show that. Suppose you ask me how tall I am. Any of you? OK, so you don't want to ask. Anyhow, uh, I'm six feet tall. And you might, might walk away and say, gee, you know, that's, that's a pretty good answer. But is it accurate? So if you came back to me and said, are you really six feet tall? I might say, well, I'm six feet tall and maybe 25 hairs on top of that thickness. And that's how tall I am. And then you can say, well, gee, how accurate is that? And then I might say, well, OK, so I'm six feet tall, 25 hairs, and maybe 10 strands of DNA. And then you say, well, is that the best you can do? <laughs> and I'll say, OK, I'll add five more atoms on top of that strand, those strands of DNA. And so what you can see from this little story that we went through is that if you ask someone a question and then ask the question about the accuracy of the answer, there are different levels of accurate answers. So when I told you I was six feet tall, if you encountered me on the street, that would be probably good enough as an answer. But if you're worried about more careful measurements of my height, then you can press me along. And this shows you something about how science works. You see, science is really about accuracy. I like to tell people that in science, we will change our beliefs at the drop of a fact. Because we're out to measure the world in accuracy. In fact, in science, if you ask someone a question, we'll give you two answers. So the first answer is, we'll, and both of them are numbers, by the way, so it might not do you any good. I'm not sure. But we'll give you two answers. The first answer is our best measurement. So we'll say, just like when you asked me how tall it was, I said, you know, I'm six feet tall. But the second thing that, as a scientist, I have to give you is the uncertainty in how I measure something. If I do not give you the second number, it turns out that's not good science. So yeah, I have to tell you the story, the number, but I have to also tell you how uncertain I am about the number. That's how science works. Now, this thing about uncertainty is rather interesting. And in fact, I, uh, you can catch me online. I recently was asked by a journalist to, to talk about the title of the, my presentation was The Uncertainty of Disbelief. And I think this is very important. Because this is, in fact, what acknowledges the range of our experiences as humans. So let's go through it. Um, you know, uh, 
there was an uh, evolutionary biologist by the name of Stephen Jay Gould. And Gould tried to explain to people why faith and science don't conflict. And he packaged it in a phrase he called it the non-overlapping magisteria. He said that each one of these systems of human thought have their range of validity. So a magisterium, right? The notion of a single area in which a set of thoughts are controlling. So he says there are non-overlapping. Now I'm a physicist, and so when you tell me something like that, what I'm going to really start asking is how can that be true? What are the mechanisms that cause the non-overlapping to occur? So I thought about it for a few years, and I think I found out some answers, and that's really what I'm going to share with you. You see, if you look at the boundary of these two things, it looks like they overlap. And in fact, we see lots of evidence of people on both sides of this divide having heated discussions in our, our society. But if you look at the part of faith, it turns out that many years ago, St. Augustine laid out a proposition which I think should be considered operative. What he said was, even a non-Christian knows something about the earth, the heavens, and the other elements of this world, about the motion and orbits of the stars, and even their size and relative positions. And then he goes on, and then he ends by saying, it is thus offensive and disgraceful for an un unbeliever to hear a Christian talk nonsense about such things. Now this comes to us from St. Augustine. I think he was probably a guy of faith, right? And so what he's saying here is that when believers, when people who have their belief grounded in faith, are confronted by evidence from the world, there, it is their belief that has to give way, not the other way around. This comes from the Catholic saint. Now, many people in our society will tell you things like, oh boy, that idea of the Big Bang, that comes from the unbelievers. But one of the most amazing things about the Big Bang, and not the TV play, but the actual expression, the Big Bang was invented by a priest. Georges Lemaitre was his name. He clearly saw it not as something against his religion. He would have never spoken it. Right? So when you hear these debates, you know, do a little bit of digging for yourself and see where it starts. So that's kind of what, that's what, how faith is protected from science. But how is science protected from faith? That's the other, I think, interesting question. And so for this one, I'm going to tell you a parable, because I like to use parables. They're pretty illustrative. Suppose I told you that tomorrow I could create a miracle. Now, if I told most of you that, you'd sort of you know, look and say, you know, this guy's kind of going around the bend. <laughs> but suppose I had a close friend and I told that to him. My friend might come with me and say, OK, Jim, show me this miracle that you're, that you're going to do. And so we go to my office. And at a, the appointed time, there's the miracle. Now, my friend, if he or she is a scientist, is going to have an immediate reaction. That reaction will be, do it again. Because you see, in science, it is not enough to say you can do something. We're trying to understand how it happens. And so in order to study how it happens, we have to study the process. So let's say I did it again. Well, then my friend might go running out to the rest of my department and say, you know, Jim can perform miracles. Come to his office. And so they come, some of my friends who have big instruments for measuring temperatures and gradients of air pressure would instrument the office. And they say, go ahead, Jim, do your miracle. And I'd do my miracle one more time. And then what would happen? Well, I would be challenged to do this over and over and over. Because you see, in science, it's about the repeatability of the experiment. You see, science is unlike other systems of human belief. We human beings try to make sense of the world around us by telling ourselves stories. Now those stories may or may not be accurate. They fulfill a deep human need to understand where we are. It's one of the most fundamental questions about human existence. On the other hand, uh, if you ask science, what is it doing? It's telling you stories, but it's also telling you how to verify the accuracy of those stories. So it's not, it is unlike most ways in which we humans come to know our existence. It's not just the story, it's the instructions for how you can verify the accuracy of the story. Those two things are joined in science in a way that I know of in no other human system of belief. That's why science is distinguished. And that property of accuracy, by the way, is why we get great apps like this. 
because you have to have something that you can rely on to build things in the world. So what is it again? So how does science get protected from faith? So in my story about performing a miracle, unless I also could perform the miracle of becoming immortal, eventually I'm going to shuffle off the coil with the rest of you. I'm going to be gone, all right? And so at that point, something very curious happens in science. Since I'm no longer there to perform the miracle, then the only thing that people have to inform them that it was done was a bunch of writing, a bunch of videotapes. But we all know that this is wonderful technology called computer graphics imagery. And so how reliable then are the videotapes of what occurred? How reliable are the stories that people tell about what Jim could do? Well, it turns out that in terms of science, they're not reliable. Because remember, science is not just telling you a story, it's telling you how to verify. And verify in science is a very direct human capacity. You get to verify, not somebody else. And since I'm no longer around, you can't verify it. And so science has built into it this system which leaves room actually for miracles, which is a really strange thought. Now, of course, people on both sides are going to disagree. For example, a few months ago, I ran into my friend Lawrence Krauss. And some of you may know Lawrence. He's a well-known figure. He's written a, a wonderful story about how our universe came into existence, the most current version of what we scientists think. And he also makes the argument that because of the way that we now think about the creation of the universe, there's no longer a need to have any faith-based system that explains the same thing. Now, I was on a panel with Lawrence right after he made this brilliant presentation. And by the way, you can see this online because it's at the, it's at the, um, the Nobel conference at Gustavus Adolphus. You can see it at YouTube. So after the presentation, like I said, it's just a brilliant talk. If you want to learn about how the universe came into being, go watch that talk. We had a panel, and he makes this point. He says, so we don't need to have any faith-based explanations. And I thought about it for a second. And I said, you know, Lawrence, that's a wonderful presentation that you gave. But I have a question for you. If all that you said is true, and I have no reason to disbelieve that, because it's in complete accord with what science tells me through the powers of observation and measurement, then you're saying that we don't need a creator. And it's not that I claim that we do, but my point is science is ill-equipped to allow you to say that. You see, it's ill-equipped because in Lawrence's construction, the question then becomes, where does time come from? Because you see, in the way he looks at the universe, he says you can have these quantum dynamical fluctu quantum fluctuations, but you don't get dynamical if there's no time. So then the question simply falls, where does time come from? It actually devastates the entire argument, and in fact, if you watch the video, you'll see Lawrence actually does not have an answer for my question. So you see, faith is actually protected by science because of the way science was built. The person most responsible for this is, is Galileo. Galileo, according to Einstein, drummed it into science that our ideas about the universe can never be accepted completely unless it is based on solid observation. That observation part is the relaying of the story in your personal verification. And so while people may disagree, as I understand both faith and science, I don't see how they disagree. I think that, I think that Stephen Jay Gould got it exactly right. They don't overlap. They're about very different things. And one of the joys about that is it allows you to be human and comfortably exist. And so I will close by telling you the sort of the greatest scientific story ever told. And that greatest story is very simple. In 13.8 billion years, the universe created exactly one copy of each and every one of us. Think of how precious that makes us. That's what science tells us. Thank you.